Peggy 18. And now, please welcome a shining example of the new America on the horizon. Who would like to say a few words of gratitude? To our honorable and faithful leaders, I want to say thank you. Thank you for your kindness, your generosity of spirit, and your concern for our future. At first, we rejected you, but that was because we did not understand. We didn't realize how much we needed you. We didn't appreciate that your arrival was a precious gift. Your presence has roused us from our complacency. We have awoken from our wasteful sleep and taken responsibility for our future. We have renewed pride in our work. We are once again enterprising, resourceful, and cooperative. Thanks to you, we have rediscovered who we are. And there's no turning back to our apathetic and misguided ways. A new day has dawned, and a brighter future beckons. And for this, we say, thank you. Please welcome your host, Matt Andrews and Fas Salim from Deep Silver Dambuster Studios. Thank you for joining us, Fas, and thanks to all of your team for bringing us Home Front the Revolution, which we are very proud to be showcasing you here at the Insomnia Gaming Festival, Insomnia 55 at the Rico Arena in Coventry with Multiplay. Uh, how are you, Fas? I'm very good, thank you. And your development team, everybody who's involved in your studio has all been working very hard on this, and I know you're all very proud of what you're going to be showing us today. Yes, absolutely. It's, it's great to be here and, and, and showcase what we've been working on for the last few years. So, yeah, how, excited. How long has this been in development? Uh, it's been in development for four years now, um, and we've been through a whole bunch of changes as well along the way. Uh, we started off uh, working with THQ, who worked on the original Homefront. Uh, obviously, uh, we, they brought us on board to work on the sequel, so at the time, this game was very different. Uh, then the whole THQ thing happened, and we had a change of ownership. At the time, we were, we were uh, Crytek UK. Mm -hmm. uh, it was uh, a different game at the time. We decided to take a step back and try to push the elements of what we thought made the first game fun, uh, and push it as wide and as open as we, as we thought we could take it. Uh, now, right now, we are with Deep Silver as Dan Buster Studios. It's basically the same team that's been working on it since the beginning. Uh, and this is definitely not a sequel to Homefront 1. This is a brand new Homefront. This is our reimagination of what we feel uh, is the best way to showcase what it means to be a guerrilla fighter in, in Homefront. Because Homefront was uh, well regarded. A lot of people liked it. Yes. But even the developers themselves said people enjoyed the conceit of it and they enjoyed the premise of it. And we made an entertaining game and people liked the world. But we perhaps just didn't quite deliver on absolutely everything we wanted to do. That's what the original studios were thinking. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, like when we started working on it, we, we looked at player feedback, what, what everyone was saying about the first home front, and everyone seemed to say that they really liked what, what the premise was, this, this role reversal of being the underdog. Um, all of a sudden, the war was on American soil. Um, that, that just really seemed interesting to a lot of people. So we thought that we, sh we wanted to focus on that and, and see where we could take it. Uh, obviously, the focus on guerrilla warfare, being the underdog, knowing what it's like to be part of a resistance, uh, these were elements that we basically wanted to build this game on. This is what we wanted to focus on. Uh, and I feel that over the years, we've, we've definitely tried to, to, to showcase what it means to be the underdog in a, in, in a, in a hostile, yeah. occupied USA. So let's just introduce people a little bit to the world before we have our playthrough, because we're very excited to be bringing you some exclusive footage here at Insomnia. Um, so what we're looking at is it's the USA. This is going to be set in Philadelphia. Yes. But you are a resistance fighter for the USA, and the Korean People's Army have invaded. Yes, so uh, you are a resistance fighter. Your name's Ethan Brady. You have already made the decision to, to take up arms and, and defend your country. Um, it's based in Philadelphia, which is obviously uh, historically significant. Uh, it, it's the U.S. birthplace of independence. Uh, so for us, it, it signifies a complete power shift. 
uh, with, with the Korean People's Army setting up their, their headquarters in the USA, the birthplace of US independence in Philadelphia. Um, so for us, it's, it's, it's taking Philadelphia, showcasing it, uh, making it an open world for the player to explore, uh, utilize the world around them to scavenge a lot of items, create their own weapons, and uh, we'll showcase some of yep. that right now. In the so in we've the got Chris here who's going to be doing our gameplay. Now this is a live gameplay run. This is not recorded footage. Yeah. This isn't a uh, pre-programmed no, sequence no, of no, events no, that you're just clicking your way through. It's all Home Front: The Revolution is an open world game, an open world first person yes. shooter. And this is live code, anything can happen. You've got a, a sort of section of the story that you're trying to play through, but this yes. is a live playthrough with live events and random events. So yeah, let me just set the premise here a bit. So this is uh, a red zone. Uh, we broke in Philadelphia into several different zones. Uh, the red zone is the bombed out suburbs of Philadelphia. This is where uh, it's, it's war torn, there's rubble, there's ruins everywhere. This is where the, uh, the KPA do not want you or any any population to be, any civilians to be around. They, it, this is a no-go zone. So you've got to be very careful. Now what Craig is doing over here is he's, he's utilizing a barrel trap. Uh, the resistance have set up traps around the whole district. And what the idea is that they can utilize these traps to ambush convoys, uh, attack the KPA when they're least expecting it. Because one of the things, like I mentioned right at the beginning, is we wanted to focus on guerrilla tactics. We don't, want, we don't want the player to be the tough guy who has the best weapons, the best grenades, and can just walk into a fight and take everyone out. In this, you've got to choose your fights very carefully, because A, you've got limited resources, you don't have the best weapons. Everything that you do in the world, you actually have to go out, you have to scavenge, you have to create these DIY homebrewed weapons. Uh, and we've provided the player with what we call the GTK, the Guerrilla Toolkit. What the Guerrilla Toolkit is, it, it allows the player to utilize the things that they scavenge in the world to create uh, various items that they can use in the, in the fight against the KPA. So this will include things like RC cars, you can put proximity mines on them, you can put distraction devices on them by putting firecrackers, uh, we've got remote IEDs, there's a whole bunch of stuff that the player can actually scavenge and create. Um, and again, it's all homebrew, it's all DIY, you've got to work for these things. These are limited resources that you have to use in a, in a strategic manner. Um, so being the underdog, again, is, is the main thing that you have to, to keep in mind, and you have to choose your fights very carefully. So that's exactly what Craig is, is going to be doing in this demo. So for people who aren't uh, familiar with the, uh, with the original game, why are you so underpowered and part of a resistance movement if you're an American and you're in the USA and you've been attacked on home soil? Can you give anything away, a little bit of backstory without spoiling too much? Uh, I can't really share too okay. much backstory, but I can tell you, obviously, like I said, the, 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 the premise for the first home front was very exciting for us. And, but one thing that we also saw was that lots of people found, uh, found it quite unbelievable that the US would actually yeah. be invaded like this. So what we thought was, okay, we'll take a step back, we'll look at what it is and try to create a more plausible, a more grounded um, well, reason for why the US finds itself in this space. So what we've actually done is we've taken a step back and we've made uh, a whole new timeline ranging back about 50 years, which we're gonna reveal in the coming weeks and okay. months as we lead up to release. And hopefully that should help explain what the key events were through history that led to the US ending up in this, in this situation. Um, so yeah, more on the red zone. Uh, Obviously, we, like I mentioned, it's bombed out, it's ruins, and we actually created this world with, with uh, traversal in mind. We wanted the player to, to use tactics that were, again, very guerrilla. So you get into a fight, you don't want to linger, you get out as soon as you've done what you need to, because you don't want to be around when the reinforcements arrive. So we built the world. And the reinforcements will arrive. The reinforcements will always arrive okay. in, in heavy numbers. So you don't have the best guns, the KBA have the best guns, they've got their drones, they've got all of the, the big weapons, so you don't want to be around when those reinforcements arrive. So you basically do what you need to do and get out of there ASAP. And we've introduced a bike in Home from the Revolution, yeah. and that is catering for the kind of environment we've created in this red zone. So we have like all of these ramps that kind of cut through buildings, quick ways to get in and out of combat. Um, Can you attack people while you're on the bike? Uh, not in the, not okay. right now, but I'm not saying that that isn't going to happen. There's that, that is potentially yeah. something that we will introduce. But uh, weapon customization, us being our studio, we have, we have a long history in, in wanting to create uh, weapons that are not only interesting, but can be heavily modified. Um, of, again, the homebrew DIY aspect of things, we've always wanted to create weapons that the player feels comfortable with. Uh, so what we've done with, with Home From The Revolution is we've created a whole bunch of base weapons that the player can 
initially acquire. But then as they scavenge through the world and get blueprints and other items, they can actually customize these weapons to be a whole new weapon in a way. So for instance, what he just used there was a base level shotgun, but he transformed that into an inferno launcher, which actually fires off uh, incendiary rounds. So it's a completely different weapon based off of a shotgun. What's he doing here? What's going on so with this So this is actually right? a network transceiver. This was actually his first objective. The network transceiver is a strike point. Uh, which when you, when you hack into it, which is what Craig just did, it actually reveals parts of the map with more content. But at the same time, taking strike points is what Home for the Revolution is all about. So basically, we're trying to fight back and take control of the city, uh, take control back from the KPA. So every time you complete a strike point in Philadelphia, you're actually introducing a resistance presence in that area. Now, this is interesting mainly because when you're introducing more resistance, that doesn't necessarily mean that the KPA are clear of that area and, and they're not going to show up. They're still there. They're the, they're the ruling party. They're going to stay there. Uh, but what you're doing is you're introducing resistance guys into the area. So whatever other missions you do in that space, all of a sudden you might find that you've got resistance back up in, in places that you wouldn't have okay. had initially. So, so you'll have NPCs who will fight with you and alongside yeah, you? Yeah, th they're going to get involved. All of a sudden you'll see maybe snipers. Maybe you'll see guys running along on the road. Um, the other thing is that every time you see people, resistance guys on the street, uh, they're actually there for their own mission, their own resistance uh, mission, objectives. So if you actually follow them, they'll actually lead you to something that they were going to go do. So it's, it all ties into trying to create an open world that's living and breathing, and, and the resistance is, is something that's going to happen whether you're there or not. So what era have you set this in? Is it present day? No, so this is uh, 2029 is when the game okay. is set. Uh, but Obviously, the lead up to all of this will hopefully reveal in the, in the coming weeks and months. And it's all set in Philadelphia as opposed to across other cities in the yeah, United yeah, yeah. States. So, so this is completely set in, in the city of Philadelphia. Uh, is it recognizable to people who've been there? Will they, will they know yeah, that? So yeah, yeah. the future moved on and the war is so torn there, down? We, we haven't gone Google Maps accurate with, with uh, Philadelphia, but people who've lived or been to Philadelphia will recognize um, key landmarks. Um, Obviously, like I mentioned right at the start, this is just the red zone. This is one of four different red zones that we have in the game. So this is just a very small fraction of what we're showing. Um, apart from the red zones, we've got yellow zones, which are a completely different feel and vibe to what we're seeing right now. The yellow zones are more of where the civilian population is, because as you can see in this, you're not seeing many civilians around. It's, it's quite, uh, yeah, it's mainly just you and drones. Uh, and KPA because no yeah. civilians are allowed here. The yellow zone is where the KPA kind of force all the civilians. So it's kind of the ghettos of the city. Okay. It's where they're, they're basically forcing the people to live so that they can keep an eye on them because it's a, it's a tighter space so it's easier to keep an eye on them. So does that mean there's loads of civilians running around you have to be more careful yes, with your changes, shooting? Yes, it changes the dynamics of you can't how you fire an incendiary where you would the, have otherwise. Whole, you can absolutely do that. But you probably shouldn't. Right? Yeah, it's like we're, we're not going to say what you can and can't do. It's just okay. a matter of it's a very different environment. So you have to be careful. There's more CCTV cameras there's more patrols on walkways um, obviously again the civilians are there as well so that's a different dynamic so it's it's a very different environment and then finally we've got green zones which is where the landmarks are these are like the posh part of town okay. this is where the landmarks are this is where uh, the the KPA have set up their headquarters basically this is where they're running the show from so we've got missions in in the green zone as well and again this is the opulent part of town yeah. which looks nothing like the other districts. And presumably those are harder because that's the kind of base absolutely those that's like We've, we've got key missions in that area as well. So uh, again, we're not showing that right now. Um, we're just focusing on the red zone at the moment. But uh, again, th there's a whole lot more to Philadelphia. And we've got, we try to make sure that we offer a lot of variety in the type of spaces the player comes across. OK, so we've got a new mission popped up here. Strike point secure the Vanguard, I think that's it. Yes, so uh, Craig obviously just did the, the antenna strike point. Now he's interacting with another strike point, which is the train yard. Uh, so I believe this is a mission where he needs to power up uh, this find a generator PC, to restore yeah, power for the, the train. Yeah. yeah, so now he's basically going to go and try to find a generator to, to power up this. Um, so strike points will uh, reveal more locations on the map. Yeah, it, it won't only reveal more locations, but it'll actually help you take a, a section of And it'll help of, with the resistance the in that area. Yeah, 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 yeah. So every strike point is linked to a, a section of, of Philadelphia. So every time you take a strike point, it's going to unlock that area and introduce resistance into that space. So uh, yeah, I mean, like there, there are all sorts of strike points in this game. And like I said, we've got strike points across multiple districts with different like atmosphere and yeah. vibe as well. So and it's an open world first person shooter. So people have got freedom. Absolutely. I mean, like again, Craig, Craig is currently freestyling it and interacting with whatever he, he feels he needs to. But uh, what we can do is after he's finished this, which he's almost done, 
He's uh, he's scavenging, isn't he? And making yeah, I think he just and switched on the generator, and he's now heading back to see whether the power is back. It should be. Um, yeah, so again, like he's got to be careful when roaming around in the open, because as you can see, we've got snipers, KPA snipers that actually occupy rooftops, and these guys can actually offer different challenges. We've got plenty of patrols and plenty of drones, and it's important for the players to utilize the GTK. So the Koreans are vastly outnumbering you in manpower and technology as well. Yes. Um, and they have drones. We've seen some drones attacking Craig earlier on. Yeah. Do you have access to anything like that? Reconnaissance vehicles? We saw a bike. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the bike, we've, we've got other vehicles as well, yeah. but I we can't really talk about okay. that too much. But the main thing is uh, the GTK allows you to subvert drones as well. So you can use that okay. to turn the tide in a you combat situation. You can hack them to fight for you. You can, you can for instance, if you see a, a secret drone, which is actually one of the drones that we saw earlier, uh, that actually scans the area for any problems. And if it actually spots you, it will call in more reinforcements. So you can actually hack that to temporarily be uh, an ally. And what okay. that will do is it will actually kind of just go and try to throw itself into the nearest KPA soldier that it can find. So. Uh, you can do various things with different drones uh, using your GTK. Um, so one of the things we can do right now is actually bring up the map and just see what kind of other strike points we have available. And uh, since this is an open world game and we've got choices, we can actually try to get some of the... So let's have a look at some of the options. Craig, just take us around a few of the, the yeah, things on the map so we can see what they are. Feel free to, to choose well. which kind of strike point you want to... Strike point here. What are the different icons uh, represent? So, so the, the blue one in the middle tells you it's a bike stash, so that okay. is basically one of the bikes that Craig was using earlier. Which we can use for fast travel. Yeah, and yeah, get around yeah, yeah. And you can, it's not fast travel, it's mainly just to traverse the district very quickly. Um, the flags themselves are normal strike points, one of which Craig just did right now. That fortress type thing in the middle is probably the toughest thing. Uh, it's a stronghold. Uh, it's where the KPA are actually using a gas injector to kind of pump gas into the tunnels that run below Philadelphia. Okay. And this is to try and prevent the resistance from utilizing these tunnels to get around. So, uh, yeah, that's probably the most difficult thing. And if you guys are feeling mean, you can try to get Craig to do that one. So should we try and find out what <laughs> we want to do? Has anybody in our audience played Homefront before, the original game? Yeah, this is nothing like that, to be honest. This is a completely <laughs> new game. few people who know it, though. <laughs> Who would like to choose what's going to happen next? Yeah, what should he interact with? No, yes, you. Yeah, great, okay. Um, so what are our choices, Craig, in our little home front the Revolution game show? Um, we've got a choice of that strike point, you've or... Got, you've got three strike points and a stronghold. Say stronghold so that Craig has Three a strike time. points, <laughs> or the thing we all want to see him die trying to fight. Uh, it's suddenly become not so much of a choice, really, I suppose. <laughs> but, you know, um, entertain us by pretending it's hard to think but about. But, yeah, yeah, you can choose, choose anyone, one. don't worry about it. Go on, what would you like us to do? Uh, let me think. This is a difficult <laughs> one, really. Yeah, uh, I think the, uh, the stronghold. Nice. Oh, there you go. To be honest, I thought it would be more of a choice. But yeah, look at that. We'd like you to die, fight <laughs> without dying at the stronghold. Please, Craig, no, no, thank you, sir. I'm sure that's... Um, <laughs> Not what you wanted, <laughs> but that's what we want to see. But yeah, so so it's it, all of the all of the strike points offer a different kind of challenge, and and the main thing that we want to offer the player is to basically choose which kind of challenge they want to take and how they want to go about it. Uh, there isn't a right or wrong way of taking on any of these challenges. Uh, it's up to the player how they go about it, and that's the main thing. Uh, like I said, the weapon customization is a big part of this, so it's it's important for us to let the player feel comfortable with what weapons they choose. So. Whatever kind of weapon they decide to construct, uh, it's their call. Whether How much can you carry? Do you have a, do you have a large loadout in this? Yeah, well, there's a fair amount you can carry, but at the moment, uh, the player is restricted to, to two weapons at a time, okay. plus a, a, a pistol. Uh, but you can you can get upgrades for that as well, which could change. Uh, and it's a first-person shooter, obviously, at its heart. Does Sorry. stealth play much of a part in this? Is there something to be gained from being really stealthy? Yeah, absolutely. I mean. Uh, Stealth is, is a massive part of the game. Uh, again, it, it depends on how the player wants to approach it. Now, this is, again, a stronghold. Craig can actually approach this in a stealthy way by using one of the, the back entrances, maybe using a vent, or he can actually just go gung-ho straight through the front door uh, and see how that turns out for him. There, there, there are a whole bunch of different ways. And as I mentioned, in the yellow zone, um, there are more people around, there are more KPA patrols around. So that, in a way, will dictate how, what kind of situations you find yourself in and how you want to approach them. It, it changes the dynamics significantly. So, um, yeah, like I said, there isn't a right or wrong way. It's just the player's way. He is checking for lots of uh, cupboards and things for items and stuff, though. 
Yeah, but, uh, well, scavenging is, yeah. is all important. He wants to make sure that he has all the ammo, all of the, the kit. Um, so yeah, th as well, that's the GTK. Well, we can run through some of the GTK stuff that, that Craig has at his disposal. So obviously, he's got uh, a hack device there. Mm -hmm. uh, along with the hack device, he's got a distraction device, uh, which is firecrackers. He's got IEDs, and then... What and he's while he's going through this menu, the world's still moving, of course. That yeah, yeah, yeah. That he's, he's thankfully in like a quiet building somewhere. That so. is a terrible guard for the KPA <laughs> in front of you. All right, he's, ooh, he's almost misspotted. Um, so yeah, each of those things can actually be deployed in, in several different ways. So as I mentioned right at the top, you can use an RC card to plant any of those things yeah. on. Um, you can just lob it at, at the enemy or wherever you feel. Um, you can so a mission isn't going to be a sort of static playthrough where it's like, I've got to go there and fight this guy to then go there and drop the thing. No, no, no. Because you can no, choose to attack absolutely. it in different yeah, ways. Yeah, yeah. You can do this whenever, however you choose to. So uh, we're not actually dictating uh, where and when the player should be at any given time. So he's, he's actually trying to play it fairly stealthy here. Because, well, this place is crawling with enemies, so at the end of the day, if he gets spotted, yeah. they're all going to be on him very quickly. It's a choke hold and a takedown. So yeah, the idea behind this stronghold is, as I mentioned, it's a gas injector, which is pumping out gas into the, into the underground network, uh, sewage network of Philadelphia. Um, so he is trying to currently take this thing down uh, so that he can open up some new routes as well in the city. So that's a Seeker. Now the Seeker has spotted him. Now the Seeker wants to call in more reinforcements, which it has. And Craig is... Ooh. So he injected himself with something that's for healing, presumably. Yes, and he that, also, that also took the guard out with it to the neck. Oh uh, no, that he used was a knife. Uh, that's a knife as At well. the end okay. of the day, uh, yeah. He, he, health packs are a big part of this game because we don't have regenerating health. We wanted to, to provide a pretty uh, challenging experience yeah. for the player. So, so like I said, it's, it's not going to be basically a situation where you can just run into a combat situation and just gun everyone down because you won't really survive that way. Uh, so you have to be careful. You have to make sure you, you scavenge for resources and use health packs because your health isn't going to regenerate. So that's, the, so that's some of the, the gas that they're pumping into the underground network, and that's flammable as well, so you can utilize that to your advantage. Um, again, just using the environment around you to try and get uh, as much damage done as possible. Blow it up, Craig. Yeah, go for it, man. <coughs> so that how, how are your environments with destructibility? Yeah, so, so well, we, we've tried to create environments which, which the player can actually utilize to mm -hmm. their advantage. So we've got plenty of things that they can actually shoot at and uh, basically get an advantage or maybe the other way around uh, if something doesn't quite go their way. So uh, there's a lot of stuff and it's a big world uh, and there's plenty for the players to actually utilize in the world to their advantage to get things done. So yeah, there's... there's nice. Um, yeah, so there's, there's plenty for them to go around doing. Uh, he's actually being pinned down by a sniper right now, so that's why he's struggling to actually get to the the strike point at the moment. Did you hear that? You're struggling. <laughs> <laughs> so this is uh, this isn't a direct sequel to the original no, Homefront. It's no, sort no, of a no, reimagining of that. There was going to be a sequel to the original Homefront, and that yeah, yeah, yeah. So I can I can give some insight into that. Basically, when we started working on this project. Uh, back in Crytek UK, and THQ actually came to us. Nice one, Craig. So that's the diner done, and that's the stronghold hey, taken. Go. So yeah, um, when, when we started off on this project, it was very much a sequel to Homefront 1. Uh, we were Crytek UK at the time, THQ came to us to actually uh, create the, the sequel for Homefront. And at that point, it was still very much a level-to-level -level, uh, game. Uh, pretty much like the first home front. Uh, then obviously TSU went under and Crytek acquired the rights for the game and we decided to basically see what we could do with it. Uh, the first thing we decided was we wanted to try and open it up, step away from the mission, uh, the level to level dynamic and, and go into an open world uh, because we felt that the open world would allow, yeah, that's an RC car. You guys have probably seen that. Uh, we've shown it before in E3 and some demos of ours as well. But again, like I said, you can apply any of your GTK items on that. Um, yeah, coming back, so uh, when Crytek acquired it, we decided to go open world with it, which obviously at the time uh, was a big decision because we had done a lot of work on, on 
Homefront 2. Uh, but then we decided to go open world, which obviously created a whole new bunch of uh, problems, as well as interesting, fun things for us to do. So uh, we started creating that open world environment, that open world game. Uh, and we felt that it provided us with a foundation to actually give a more authentic uh, resistance experience of what it means to be a guerrilla fighter because all of a sudden we're giving the player a city where they can walk around and, and explore and, and try to fight back, uh, try to take control back from the KPA. So it was basically giving us a true guerrilla experience that we couldn't quite deliver in, in a linear shooter. Um, so that was a great decision for us and then obviously now uh, where we're Deep Silver, uh, Dan Buster Studios, uh, we're, we're the same team that's been working on this project since the beginning, but we are definitely not uh, creating a Homefront sequel. Uh, this is a brand new game. This is a, a reimagination of, of, of what we feel is, is Homefront. Uh, all we've taken from the first game is the universe, because I think that was something that everyone found interesting, yeah. including us. Um, but we wanted to basically provide a gameplay experience to, to basically let the player know what it means to be the underdog and, and, and what it means to actually have to fight and scavenge and, and work for, for every win, every battle. Yeah. So the stronghold is gone. Yeah, the stronghold is gone. Contrary, perhaps, to everyone's expectations of you, Greg. <laughs> we, we knew you could do it. We knew you could do it. <laughs> now, what are you going to bring up? Let's just have another little look at the map. So yeah, you can you can go ahead and do one more strike point, I guess, and then we can see how much you've unlocked from there. And the world reacts. Doesn't it? As you say, it's open yeah, world. Yeah, yeah. So, and so that's true in this code as absolutely. well. This is a uh, this is not a static playthrough, as we mentioned earlier on. This is live code. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is a live code, and the world will react to you. So, as I mentioned, taking strike points will not only introduce resistance into the area, but there'll actually be a physical change in the space as well. So, as you work through the world, you'll actually come across spaces that you've been to before, but they look nothing like they did initially, because the world will now be vandalized. There'll be graffiti. There'll be people out on the streets protesting. Um, and that's what you're trying to do. You're trying to ignite a revolution. You're trying to get people to come out in the streets and stand up to the KPA. Um, so yeah, the world is going to keep changing as you do more and more stuff in the world. Uh, and you're going to see civilians respond to you. You're going to see people respond to you. Initially, they might be a bit hesitant towards you because they're not comfortable with what you're doing, walking around with a gun. Uh, but as, as time goes on and you, you actually try to ignite more of a revolution, you'll actually get people out in the street. And you'll see that. You'll see people taking on the KPA and and, and just the dynamics of how that power shift takes place uh, will unfold as you play. That's a, that's a resistance fighter running yeah, on Yeah, yeah, well. so that's, that's one of the resistance fighters that, that have shown up after Craig has uh, been going around doing some strike points. Uh, so this is a distraction device. It was just a bunch of firecrackers. What it does is it will go off, it lures in KPA, and then he can go around doing whatever it is that he wants to do. Do you know how many permutations there are of weapons? And too many to, too many. to go through <laughs> over here. Um, we've, got, we've got a whole bunch of base weapons, everything from shotguns to assault rifles to sniper rifles, but all of those have uh, numerous, numerous, numerous modifications. And, and like I said, you can, you can make weapons become completely different to what they, they were originally meant to do. So weapons-wise, we've, we've, again, tried to all provide the player with as much as, as we possibly could. Um, so that every player that actually plays this game can, can feel comfortable with the arsenal that they have at their disposal. Um, and that for us was important because uh, in, in a game that's limited on resources, it's, it's important to let the player choose where those resources are invested and feel comfortable with, with the stuff that they're using in the game. So you're underpowered against the KPA. Is yeah. it going to have multiplayer? Uh, well, we've announced co-op. Uh, yeah. Co-op is definitely something that we're doing. Uh, Co-op is going to be something that is going to take place in the same universe, the same world that you can experience in a single player level. Um, and for us, we felt that co-op actually helps us provide uh, an experience that would reflect what it means to be part of uh, a resistance. So you can get together with your friends, create a small resistance cell, and try to fight for the city uh, with your friends. And try is to the whole game playable like that, or is it pockets of the there, map where you're going in Like I said, we've got loads of different districts, yeah. loads of different zones, and all of those zones will have various uh, co-op yeah. missions uh, for, 
for everyone to do. But a multiplayer kind of battle arena part, that's not Oh, no, we're not, we're not really talking too much about multiplayer beyond the point of yeah. we're, we're doing co-op. Uh, hopefully we'll, we'll talk more about that in the future, in the coming weeks and months. Got him. Good boy, Craig. Right, so Craig is almost at his final strike point. So yeah, he's got some resistance friends now, obviously roaming around in the area. They heard some gunfire, they decided to get involved. Um, now, if, if he had actually approached this one before he had done some of the other strike points, this would have been a whole lot more difficult. Yeah. Because he wouldn't have had any resistance backup, he would have basically been going into this alone. Um, would there have been more enemies as well? Th it's not just that you've got more allies. No, no, no. So, so there would be enemies around, but as you do more and more strike points, uh, the KPA kind of get forced into their compound. So the, the number of KPA within their own compounds will increase, making that more challenging. Okay. Um, so again, it, it, it's cause and effect. It's basically everything that you're doing in the world is going to affect something else uh, and the way that the enemy uh, is, is protecting themselves as well as their, their uh, buildings. It's a mean shotgun. The future is not colourful. No, we, is it, in we purposely actually created the red zones to be that way. Um, oh, oh, unlucky, man. <laughs> so close. Are you doing so well? Yeah. What happens next? So, oh. so yeah, um, we actually purposely decided to go down that route. Like I said, we've got different districts, different zones. Uh, each of them has their own field. So the red zone is meant to be bleak, and that's what we were going for, yeah. But other parts of the map might be a bit more colourful. Completely different. different. Like I said, areas. the green zones, the opulent part of yeah. town is very different, and the yellow zone has more civilians, more uh, food rations, CCTV cameras, all of that has a different feel. Um, obviously, it's Philadelphia. It has different different atmospheres, different yeah. vibes throughout the whole place, so we've tried to capture as much as we could and, and provide that in the gameplay experience as well in the environments. And it's been in development for over four years. Yes, and it's so been through different hands along the way. Yeah. Well, yeah, it's gone through lots of yeah, teams. Same, but yeah, it's been the core team working on it. It's been the same, but we've, we've had different ownership, yeah. When is it going to be available to everybody else? Uh, it's going to be available in 2016 uh, on PC, PS4, and Xbox One. That's what we're all looking forward to. Yeah. Brilliant. Well, thank you very much for your time. Cool. No Big thanks to Deep Silver Dambuster Studios for joining us here at the Insomnia Gaming Festival. That is Homefront the Revolution. Thank you very much to Craig. And ladies and gentlemen, please show your thanks as well to Fas Salim. Thank you. Cheers. Thanks. And carry on watching our YouTube channels and all the information we're putting out during our Insomnia Gaming Festival here at the Rico Arena in Coventry. We've got three days of loads of gaming goodness and you can watch it all here on our YouTube channel.